Welcome back to Future's End. To recap, this is what I decided to do with my life. Before we get back to the main action, let's talk about the title of this thing. I was hoping to give a little history lesson on the etymology of the phrase Future's End, show historically where it came from, how it's been used over the years, but of course Google has failed me since any attempt I've made to search for it keeps bringing me back to like two things. One, this comic, and two, the Star Trek Voyager two-parter that uses it as a title. And I have a hard time believing that it was Voyager that originated it, so here we are. When it is used, it's usually in a time travel story like this one, referring to changing the future for better or worse. The futures bit uses a possessive apostrophe, since the end that is being referred to belongs to the future. Problem is, that's not the name of the comic. There is no apostrophe in the title of this book. It is Futures as a plural, as in multiple futures are ending. In interviews, I recall them saying that this is because there are so many characters and so many futures that are coming to a definitive conclusion during the events of this story. Whereas I believe it was a typo, and everybody was just too embarrassed to admit they screwed it up, so they're just rolling with that. Anyway, back to our ending futures still in progress. Robots. Frankenstein loathes robots. Frankenstein hates when characters start speaking in the third person for no reason. Also, Spider-Man said it better. Robots. I hate robots. The engineer manages to access the carrier's computers, but the navigation system is gone, so if they jump, they might end up anywhere in the multiverse. However, with the robots beginning to overwhelm them, they make the leap and disappear. Man, DC's version of Exiles had a weird start. Several issues later, the group suddenly rematerializes in orbit around Earth. No harm, no foul. They're taken in by Shade's mobile headquarters, called the Ant Farm, and while they're happy they're all alive, they insist on having the Engineer come with them, since she's the only weapon that can be used to stop Brainiac. Unfortunately, because Shade is, well, shady, they don't frame it as, hey, we need your help to stop the horrific monster that's still coming, but rather, you're coming with us to stop it or we'll force you to come with us. And when they refuse to let her go, Father Time reveals that Shade has a bunch of kaijus at their beck and call that will be unleashed upon the group if they don't hand her over. Father Time, you might recall, was also that dumbass fascist from Battle for Bloodhaven just in a new body here. So you can see how his people skills have improved. While Black Adam makes short work of the kaijus, Ray Palmer broadcasts some kind of telepathic message to all of Shade, basically saying he's dethroning Father Time and taking control of Shade himself. He shrinks and goes inside Father Time's body, meeting the actual Father Time, which is this weird face-hugger-looking thing. Father Time reveals himself to be an alien who came to Earth 200 years ago after Brainiac destroyed his entire race, and that he actually plans to destroy the Engineer because she's been compromised by Brainiac. So that makes his attempt at just taking her even dumber. Everyone keeps saying Father Time is duplicitous and secretive and deceptive, but he's honestly never presented that way. He's boisterous and unsubtle and kind of a dumbass. Anyway, Ray manages to extract Father Time from the body and brings it with him to normal size, but before they can do anything more, one of the Shade agents shoots Frankenstein and mortally wounds him. The nth metal in his blood is transforming him into something more human, which unfortunately means making him more susceptible to harm. Father Time could be helpful, but since he resembles the face hugger and all, Ray Palmer took a hint from aliens and shoved him in a tube full of... Tube juices. I have no idea what's in that thing. Hawkman and the Engineer work to start cleaning up Shade. Black Adam heads back to Earth as per the agreement Ray made with him. And Ray now needs to work on building an army to prepare for Brainiac's arrival. With no other choice, Amethyst takes Frankenstein to go and try to find a magical solution to saving his life. Which also fails, as a group of magic users are unable to heal him as well. Well, he is technically made of a bunch of parts stitched together. Have you considered taking him apart and then putting him back together after cleaning them? Constantine shows up as an astral projection, and we learn that it's his fault that Gemworld fell. Apparently, for whatever reason, Apocalypse's forces didn't just attack Earth, but other dimensional places like Gemworld, too. Amethyst called out for help, and Constantine answered, promising to stop them 
And instead, he trapped the parademons there so they couldn't go back to Earth, devastating Gemworld to save everybody else on Earth. He claims it's because Gemworld was already doomed, but still dick move, man. Still, he's here to try to save Frankenstein, saying that the only way to do so is to bring him back to Castle Frankenstein. If this comic suddenly goes black and white and becomes an actual homage to proper universal Frankenstein movies, I will take back every bad thing I said about it. Well, except for the stuff about the Firestorm plot, screw that. Arriving in Castle Frankenstein, they find the place inhabited by steampunk cyborg animals. Full disclosure, I actually really like this subplot, and goofy crap like that is the reason why. As well as a still-living Dr. Frankenstein, who's clearly had some work done, what with his very pristine face and the steampunk robot torso he has. He says that he can transfer Frankenstein's consciousness into a new body, but will only do so if he allows him to adjust his brain to be more docile and loyal to him. Naturally, Frankenstein refuses, happy to die a man rather than become a true monster, especially in light of his visions of the brother eye controlled future. Speaking of, good job following up on that whole we're partially to blame for the apocalypse plot point that turned out to be absolute bullcrap. Amethyst accepts his logic, and decapitates the good doctor on the spot. She then proceeds to deal with all the other steampunk monsters single-handedly, leaving her alone with Frankenstein. His last requests are for her to burn the doctor's organic bits to make sure he can never live again, and to provide him with pen and paper so he can finally tell his story. Hopefully it is a better one than Future's End. And so Frankenstein dies. Inspired by his final words to her, Amethyst swears to go back to Gemworld and free it from Apocalypse. She wants an army to do so, but if no one will help her, she'll do it alone. Just her and her sword. Well, not just her sword. This subplot is honestly the best one in Future's End. Which is especially hilarious because this conclusion here has nothing at all to do with the actual ending to the story. Oh, uh, hey, Linkara. Still trying to get the signal right. It's all good. Say, where's Phalus in this future of yours? Oh, him? Uh, yeah, I sewed his face onto my stomach. What? Yeah, yeah, just recently, too. He won't shut up about it, either. You sewed his... Why? Huh. You know, I don't remember... Seems kind of stupid now that I think about it. I agree! Quiet, you! Ow! Oh, I remember now. It was a fad. Yeah, happened right after Beanie Babies made their comeback. At the time, seemed like the natural progression from one to the other. Whoops. Uh, losing the signal. Listen, uh, I'm gonna take a break and feed him. Doesn't even lift a finger to help pay for his food. This shouldn't even work. Well, on the plus side, Beanie Babies come back. Fifty Sue brings her little ragtag group down into her own secret bunker, completely protected from Brother Eye's tracking, and filled with hatches, a rusty box with some animal inside of it, and a bunch of stuff you'd normally find in a Hellraiser movie. Welcome to my creepy basement. Brother Eye does communicate with her, but honestly, it's kind of hilarious. This is not in keeping with our agreement. Lying to machines is okay. It says so in the Bible. No, Susan, it does not. Well, it's in the Septuagint, so it kinda counts. Grifter wonders why she can't just blink Brother Eye out of existence. She admits she can, but this is all just a game to her, so she doesn't care to. Which seems a little ridiculous, since she's basically a small child with all the cheat codes ready. Grifter thinks they need to just get the hell out of there and asks Faraday to bring them with him. Deathstroke says he can't because of the teleport tech coordinates thing, but Grifter says he's realized his power does see through deception, and thus he knows that Faraday is lying. He's a superhuman too, a teleporter. While he may need coordinates to know where he's going, the truth is he can leave anytime he wants, and thus Faraday sees no reason to stick around since Grifter isn't going to be helpful, and just leaves without taking anyone with him. Deathstroke is pissed though, because without Faraday, he knows just how screwed up this all really is. Cadmus was Faraday's obsession, and how bad does the situation have to be if even the obsessed see how bad it is? See, you say that, but Brother Eye was also still threatening to kill his family and loved ones if he didn't cooperate, so probably not that bad. 
50 Sue, though, says they're gonna storm the compound and free the island. Okay, which of you wears the red shirt? I need some cannon fodder in this fight, and I need to know which one of you I'm calling Ensign Expendable. Although Sue taunts Brother Eye, it manages to get into her head a bit by showing her her Cadmus file. It lists off details about her creation, utilizing 52 different DNA strands to grant her the superpowers she now wields, but also that she's dangerously delusional and sociopathic. What I don't get is why she cares about it and denies the truth of the file. Also, I'm pretty sure that computer she's using is just a bathroom scale. But what really hits close to home is the revelation that it was Deathstroke who initially invited Brother Eye into the systems and specifically mentions that Sue will be a problem. It shatters Sue's perception of Slade as the one she considers herself a sidekick to. Which is already weird since you'd think the one who had the godlike powers would be the one who had sidekicks, not the other way around. Lois Lane's story at this point pretty much dovetails into the Cadmus stuff, so we'll talk about it here. Tim Drake goes to see her since Madison has been missing for days and wonders if Lois has seen her. When she says no, she also wonders if he'll head out to the coordinates. And of course, with Madison missing, why the hell would he? Instead, he suggests she make a leap of faith and go herself. Hope it works out better for you than it did for me. Man, this is gonna be extremely awkward if after all that it turns out it was just an overly elaborate surprise birthday party for Tim. Some of the plot threads all begin to converge on Cadmus Island. 50 Sue is missing in the wake of the revelations about Deathstroke. Slade himself is leading Grifter and Lana Lang to the vault containing all of Cadmus's DNA samples of various superhuman beings to make sure Brother Eye can't use it to grow its own soldiers. Mr. Miracle observes something being done to Power Girl while he evades Brother Eye's other mind-controlled forces, Green Arrow's troops heading right for the island by boat, and Lois herself parachuting down towards the island despite not being able to see it. And it feels like we're actually heading towards a climax to this book. Despite the fact that it's only issue 27 at this point. Once on the island, Lois manages to somehow easily outrun the Omax patrolling it, despite them all seeing her, and trips over the dying body of her Earth 2 counterpart, the one who got turned into Red Tornado. Green Arrow's forces arrive on the island and engage the Omax and mind-controlled heroes. And just to be a major dick, Brother Eye fuses a bunch of Omax together into a giant version. And this remake of Power Rangers RPM is weird. Deathstroke, upon spotting Green Arrow, decides to try to kill him out of personal spite, but when Grifter intervenes, Deathstroke decides to kill him, too. At least Lang provides some eye candy. Douche Stroke. Lana knocks him out with a rock and they head over to join up with Green Arrow. Deathstroke recovers and goes after them, running right into Green Arrow's forces. Working for a machine now, Slade? Pathetic. That machine has access to every bank account on Earth, Queen even yours, and money will surely be useful after I've helped it usher in the destruction of all mankind. God, I miss when my character was well written. Fortunately, Fury and Mr. Miracle show up and, well, Fury rips his head off. Let's not be too quick to celebrate. With Brother Eye around, it's entirely possible that that head will sprout little spider legs like in John Carpenter's The Thing. Green Arrow, Mr. Miracle, Barda, and Fury make their way inside the complex looking for Brother Eye's central computer. Unfortunately, it's guarded by Power Girl. Ollie is able to take out the computer and disable the mind control over the Earth 2 prisoners and Omax, but Power Girl is still fighting. After Barda rips off part of Power Girl's scalp, it's revealed that Brother Eye is now housed inside of her. What better place to host my primary intellect than one known to be near indestructible? You're telling me you can transform someone as powerful as a Kryptonian to be a cyborg zombie slave of your will, even housing your consciousness inside of it, and you don't have to transform them into a cyborg spider zombie to do it? I hate this comic so much! The Earth 2 Lois tells regular Lois to make a run for it and to tell her story and the story of everyone on the island. Which she was going to do anyway, meaning their encounter with each other was completely pointless. Barda manages to kill Power Girl as everyone escapes the island. The complex, and a good chunk of the island, exploding because... I guess a failsafe self-destruct was tripped? I don't know and I so don't care. Barda dies in the explosion, but Green Arrow also says that indeed he wanted Lois on the island and not Tim. Which raises the question of why the hell they sent that stuff about Tim to her if he wanted her there! I think the real reason why the future is ending is because this comic keeps wasting our time! 
While they got some of the survivors, unfortunately a lot of the regular humans on the island were killed in the blast. And we see that Brother Eye survived, transferred into Lois's cell phone. In the wake of all this, Lois reveals her story in a massive press conference, keeping out that Green Arrow is alive, but telling the story of Cadmus kidnapping people and the experiments they had to endure. Cadmus in this version of events is also a massive international corporation, so Lois declares that she's going to do everything she can to bring the company to justice as the criminals they are. And Lois's story needed to be a subplot of this book for 30 issues that neither changed changed her, nor had her go through major hardship because it didn't. It didn't need to be that. In fact, her one major contributing point, the revelation that Captain Marvel is masquerading as Superman, has affected nothing in the story. This is not a good comic. While Grifter and Lana Lang take up a life as a fake married couple, 50 Sue goes to the warehouse where Cadmus is storing the remains of everything recovered from the island. She's pissed that Deathstroke died before she could kill him, and decides to go after Brother Eye. Spoilers, she does not do that. And wears Slade's mask in the process. Ew, I think there's blood in this thing! 50 Sue, for whatever reason, doesn't work for Faraday, who wants all the genetic research from Cadmus back, but lost it all in the explosion on the island, and coincidentally runs into Justin, who's finally been told by Grifter of his current situation. 50 Sue brings the two of them back to Faraday and Sergeant Rock, because why not at this point? Faraday says the DNA vault on Cadmus survived the explosion, but it sank to the bottom of the sea. But enough of that, time for weird drama and character development. For whatever reason, Lana Lang has decided that what 50 Sue really needs is a mother. So she basically puts herself in that position and reads her the riot act and demands that if she's gonna be Sue's mother, she needs to listen to her and stop being a homicidal bratty monster. Which might even be compelling or interesting or good development if we hadn't spent the past 30 issues with her and this suddenly coming out of left field, both from Sue and Lana Lana Lang. This is, again, one of those moments that works better on paper than in execution. I see what they're getting with it, trying to steer the monster she is into something more human, but it's so late in the game for both characters that it just doesn't work. What's more, this storyline started as grifters, and now he's barely involved in any of it! In any case, Sue recovers the vault for them, but she summons it onto the top of a building, where its heaviness falls down and smashes through a good chunk of it. When Faraday lets slip what's inside the vault, it piques Sue's attention. Voodoo's murder crew, who are still a part of this story, I guess, seemingly kill Sue, but then she, Grifter, Lana, and the vault disappear. They end up in a desert, where they're not sure what to do with it. Lana thinks it's too dangerous to keep around, but Sue thinks it's important since that's where she was born, and, well, we see she's still kind of murder-happy when she creates a little sand toy of Deathstroke and blows it up. So, that whole motherhood thing is working out really well for you, Lana. Keep up the good work. Sue ends up teleporting Justin into their weird, mixed-up little family unit, but fortunately for Lana and Grifter, he brought booze with him. Hey, only one drinking problem per family. Fortunately, I am not in your family. Unfortunately, I used up all my booze after issue zero. By the third to last issue, they make a threat to Sergeant Rock so he won't pursue them, shrink down the vault full of DNA samples to keep it safe, and I guess that's the end of that! Thank goodness for that compelling storyline. I cared so much about it. Oh, Ilinkara! Game show reviewer? Okay, I definitely wasn't expecting you. How bad is the future for you? Bad? No, no. Things aren't bad here at all, really. Really? Nope. Oh, uh, I'll talk to you in a minute. I gotta go do a thing right quick. Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President, assembled members of Congress, my fellow Americans, I come before you today to say the state of our union has never been stronger. In fact, we're up 300 points since the last round. Now the Senate's going to need to start pulling its own weight. They want to stick around through round three. And what a beautiful showing by the House Ways and Means Committee last round. However, I believe the board belongs to appropriation, so let's get things started. People of America, Diamanda Hagen here, Empress of all womankind. 
And I know you're all very interested in who is going to win your little country, but I thought I'd let you know that me and the forces of Afghanistan, though mainly me, are declaring war on you, we're going to invade, and we're going to take you over! And then we're probably going to do something interesting afterwards, like a local jig or something. Teddy, demonstrate the jig! Have you seen a sexier dance? I doubt it. No longer do the jig! Now, many of you might think that this is in retaliation, very late retaliation, for that time the United States invaded MY glorious country, thanks to the help of that traitorous little skull. But it's nothing to do with that, it's actually because I hate all of you, you stupid stars and stripes wearing Americanish. American wankers. And what with Brother Eye fucking your shit up right now, there is no better time. So, see you soon. <laughs> well, looks like we're going to war, or as we call it here on Capitol Hill, the lightning round. Who will win? Find out. All that and more right after this. Stay tuned. In narration, Constantine explains that Superman has never really fought Brainiac before, just avatars and surrogates of him. The real Brainiac is a Lovecraftian god, and older and more deadly than the ones before. He, it exists outside time and space, in darkness thick as blood. And yet Black Adam was able to hurt it by calling down some lightning, so maybe don't sell it quite as hard, John. Superman is able to fight the killer robot, but it teleports away, seemingly destroyed. However, Constantine believes that this was just a test of his abilities, the robot just a scout to see how powerful Superman really is. If it's left, then it's probably going to report these findings to the real Brainiac, no doubt heading for one of seven sites across the globe that are portals to Brainiac's domain. And it takes another few issues before that's picked up on again as Superman, Constantine, and Midge head to Siberia, specifically to where the Tunguska event occurred. Why did you bring me here? Dude, I know it was a few issues ago, but you're trying to track the Brainiac drone! Pay attention! Then again, Supes doesn't seem to be firing on all cylinders because he decided to go to Siberia without a shirt. I know, the cold doesn't bother the guy, but the implication is that they took a plane out here or something. So did Superman just not wear a shirt during this entire time? And if it was Superman himself who flew the two out there, why didn't he ask the question of why they were going to Siberia during that entire time? Oh, but Constantine decides to not actually answer his question. Do you know what the bloody significance of here is? Tunguska. In 1908, this area was devastated when a meteorite exploded. Right, right, a meteorite. Or was it a rocket fired from doom with a message of hope? Yes, it was from doom that it was fired! And that message of hope, that doom will save you all! Like, was that a typo and they meant to say doomed planet? Because they didn't fix it in the trade or anything. And why the hell was he referencing Superman's origin there in relation to the Tunguska event? Why are you being snarky instead of giving a straight answer? The only one making sense is Midge, who's running around in her underwear insulting both of them because whatever the Brainiac bot did to her is making her go crazy and worship Brainiac. Speaking of, the bot reappears. Or at least the energy that was inside of the bot. And it possesses a grizzly bear, giving it this very creepy, glowy, transparent effect where we can see its skeleton. Krypton, last of your race. Welcome. Dude's supposed to be an ancient evil god that can possess grizzly bears, but doesn't know that the descriptor is Kryptonian and not Krypton. After saying that Kal-El is special because of how his dad saved him, the bear explodes. Again, it's the lady who's gone nuts from Brainiac's influence that makes the most sense here. Superman wants to know how they can stop Brainiac, and Constantine says he has to go home. I hate to tell you this, Superman, but Brainiac is buying out your farm. If you can win the dance competition, you can stop him. The group heads to Smallville, where Constantine explains that those spots on Earth he mentioned before are like black holes of evil, sucking in anything good. And indeed, there's one in Smallville, speculating that the rocket containing Superman as a baby drew him there deliberately because of his inherent goodness. At the Kent farm, we learn some more backstory about why Clark stopped being Superman. Some sort of trick that Batman played on him that he can't get over. Not that it really matters, nothing in this book matters, more on that later, since a bunch of little yellow creatures emerge from a cornfield and attack. 
apparently part of some primordial stew left behind by Brainiac, and no, it doesn't make any sense, and no, I don't really care. Also, Midge gets impaled by a stalk of corn that just flies out for some reason and kills her. Farewell, Midge. We hardly knew ye. Mainly because, as far as I can tell, you were introduced in Future's End and have had no character development at all. Frankly, your unique and ridiculous death is the most interesting thing about you. Clark repels the creatures and sets fire to the cornfield, but Constantine says this is all happening because of Brainiac's coming return. He wants to take a piece of the world with him. And Constantine knows all this because, shut up, we need something to move the plot along. With her dying breath, Midge admits that the piece of the world Brainiac is going to take is Manhattan. With that, Superman flies off to go save the day, and this confusing and dumb subplot can finally end. Oh goody, who from the future is going to talk to me now? Hey me. Oh, it's me. Man, I go downhill in five years. No, 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 I'm you from 30 years in the future, and hey, screw you! Oh. Well, how are things that much farther down the road? Well, I'd love to tell you, but I can't be certain of anything because of you! What? What did I do? I keep communicating with you, and the future keeps changing! Sometimes I'm living with my parents, sometimes I've moved on on my own, sometimes I've moved many times! Sometimes I'm reviewing Final Crisis, other times you've removed it years ago! The future just keeps changing, and I've had it! You realize that just by talking to me, you're making the future change again, right? Hey, stop trying to confuse me like that. I'm warning you, stop talking to people in the future. It's having dire consequences to my present! Look, if something bad happens in the future, it's our responsibility to try to prevent that. Damn it, just do what I say! You're not the boss of me. Just be careful what you do to the future. Who knows what kind of changes could happen next? I have no reason to preserve your future. Hey, how about this? If you promise to stop changing the future, I'll give you some lottery numbers or something. Okay, now that I'm down with. No more changes to the future. Good. Then you won't need these lottery numbers. Bye! <laughs> Damn it! Ronnie, while talking with Madison, spots news about a tsunami and goes to Jason in the lab, begging him to become Firestorm with him so they can help. Jason, of course, refuses after what happened, but he then throws out another theory, that he's not doing this because Firestorm is needed, but because he needs to be Firestorm. Yeah, the flying, the adulation, hanging with Superman in the League, I miss it. And I want it back. Wow, I was actually going to give you the benefit of the doubt since you seemed to be acting like a better person, Ronnie. But then you just admitted to being King Douche the Third, wanter of fame and glory. Rot in hell. He does at least give a sincere apology about what happened and doesn't press it, but that's hardly enough to make up for what he did in his admission right there. Just wow! To make matters worse, Yamazake was observing this little exchange and now realizes that Jason used to be Firestorm. And because he's an obsessed lunatic, he didn't hear the part about him not wanting to be a superhero anymore and thinks Jason is just trying to sabotage his teleportation experiments for the League. He quickly suspends Jason's access to the lab and threatens him to stay away or face jail time. Madison comes in later looking for him, but Yamazake recognizes her last name as being the same as her father, the one who sold defense secrets, and decides to make her his first human test subject. Good job, Ronnie! Your selfishness about this whole thing has brought about even more lives ruined! You should hook up with Lois Lane. She's great at that, too. Ronnie and Jason are summoned to a courtyard by Batman, who says that the two need to grow the hell up. Ronnie kept Jason prisoner! For weeks! He subjected him to stimuli and experiences that were unwanted and prevented him from living his own life, bat dick! He says they especially need to stop guilting over Green Arrow's death, because he already figured out that Green Arrow is alive and well. This entire conversation is framed like the problem is just the guilt over Green Arrow, while ignoring the horrible and evil things that Ronnie did to Jason! And even if that wasn't the case, Ronnie admitted he only wants the adulation being a superhero brings! No wonder future Batman didn't want Terry contacting you! At this point in time, you are a complete and utter moron! 
Tim, still looking for Madison, ends up going to Ronnie for help. The two head off to look for Jason, since the two are in the same college study group, but Jason himself has discovered how unhinged Dr. Yamazaki has gotten, sitting in his apartment watching the news footage of his family being killed in a tower over and over. Not helped by his wall of paranoid photographs of people that he's crossed out. Which you'd think crossing out would mean he's already killed them, but then again, I'm trying to find logic in the crazy man who hates superheroes and watches the footage of his family getting killed on a loop. Surprisingly, we get a connection to Cadmus in this storyline too, as it seems they're the ones bankrolling the teleportation experiments, their own guards protecting the lab, as Ronnie and Tim go there to try to find Madison and Jason. Those two college twerps took down Willie and the boys. Deathstroke is gonna have our heads if we don't beat him. Eh, I wouldn't worry about that. Deathstroke has his own head problems to worry about right now. Jason manages to get into the lab before the other two, Yamazake revealing to Madison that he's Firestorm. My god, is there anyone in my whole life who has been honest with me? Madison, perhaps it's best to contemplate these things when a mad scientist isn't trying to turn you inside out. Yamazake knocks Jason down and starts the teleportation, but Ronnie manages to get into the lab. He opens the tube she's in and pulls her out before she starts beaming away, but the energy inside of it latches onto him instead. Jason and Ronnie try to form Firestorm to stop the process, but Jason's hand goes right through Ronnie and touches Madison instead. In his final act of redemption, Ronnie admits that this is all his fault and apologizes again for this whole mess. And explodes, taking out the entire lab in the process. Credit where it's due, clearly they were trying for an arc with Ronnie, especially acknowledging what he did wrong and trying to save Madison, but it's still got some problems. What would have fixed this is if he hadn't been so cavalier about being a hero and the whole I want the fame and glory aspect of Firestorm. If he had said that that's how he used to be, that he's changed and wants to help people, that would have gone a lot better. This story works on paper, but especially after what he put Jason through, it's iffy, and it isn't quite as good as it wants to be. It's very nearly there, but not quite enough. Shooting out of the explosion, though, is a new firestorm made of Madison at the wheel and Jason inside of her head. He gives her the lowdown of how it works and explains how they can separate again, since neither really wants this gig. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, they can't split apart. Mind you, they're also standing on top of a large skyscraper, so maybe that's for the best. Unfortunately, Yamazake survived the explosion, his body transformed into some kind of living magnetic field. He blames the Justice League for all this and assembles a suit that he can use to take them on, becoming a new Dr. Polaris. Both he and Firestorm head to the ruins of the lab to find information to handle their respective problems, coming to a fight. Of course, Madison has never been in a fight and doesn't really grasp her powers, so it's a little one-sided. They just barely manage to survive, mostly through Tim's intervention, and get away. They go to the JLA for help, trying and failing to use their teleporter to separate themselves. Learning about what Yamazake was trying to do, Madison takes charge and decides to finally put this crap to rest, saving the JLA from an attack by him and making a deal. Help her get separated from being Firestorm, and she'll help him share the transporter technology with the world. And presumably stop trying to kill people, I imagine, though that part's kind of unspoken. Unfortunately, before they can get down to work, all of the Justice League's deep space alarms go off at once. Brainiac is coming. Ray Palmer with Stormwatch arrive to let them know what's up, but unfortunately, as Brainiac gets closer, the engineer is taken over again by him and starts raining down objects onto Manhattan. This is where the subplots start coming together, so before we continue, let's finish up with Terry's stuff, where... Nash? Hey. Okay, so what happened to you? Do you have a colony of spider robots living in your beard? Were you forced to take on the identity of another critic? Are you here because you don't remember which episode I'm doing? What? Oh, none of that crap. I'm completely normal. Five years have come and gone, and I'm still me! Oh, thank God. I was beginning to think that everybody- It's everybody else has gone nuts! I can't do what the fuck is wrong with you anymore. Because the entire world has gone insane! Well, I guess based on the conversations I've had with everybody else, I can believe that. I mean, have you heard about the fad of sewing someone else's face... ...to your chest? I, I, I don't even top something like that. Nothing in Florida could ever match the madness that has overtaken the world, and I... ...I know who's responsible. Brother I, right? No! It was the Illuminati aliens! Art Bell <laughs> was right the whole time. Those elitist aliens are the real threat! 
I'd take it over for him. Along with the lizard people, right? Don't be an idiot, Linkara. Lizard people are just as much victims as we are. Okay. Uh, listen, I'm gonna let you get back to that, man. Okie dokie. Time to get back to Radio Dead Air. The only stories about things going up people's butts now are the probes! I've got to admit, it's not really that much better. Terry talks to Plastique about their next move, getting help from Tim Drake. She wonders why they don't just go to the JLA with what they know and ask for help. If I contact anyone who exists in the future, it compromises the future. Explaining what the future holds to someone who I know exists in the future, who's to say the knowledge I drop doesn't have them bring that future to bear? Oh, I get it. You're an idiot. The entire point of this trip is to go back and alter history! What were you planning on doing if you had arrived when you were supposed to? If you sabotaged Brother Eye without telling Bruce or Mr. Terrific why, they'd probably just try again! I mean, I get what he's saying about the potential for causing the future he's trying to prevent, but Brother Eye's been built! It's a threat now! Get the people who know what the hell they're doing in on this, Terry! The entire premise of this operation hinges on the ability to change the future! But no, go with Tim, because according to Alfred's records, there's no evidence that he exists after this year. What if it's you asking Tim Drake for his help that gets him killed? Then that's what happened. Already. So I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to do. There is logic in what he says. I mean, just by that reasoning, Terry, you shouldn't even be here trying to prevent Brother Eye's takeover of the planet, since that's what happened in the past! Terry McGinnis, moron of tomorrow! Terry and Plastique wait for Tim in his bar, and Terry observes that Plastique is kind of conspicuous in her supervillain attire. You kind of stand out. Yeah, I do. That's the point of being alive. No, the point of being alive is trying to stay alive. That's bleak, McGee. Yeah, it is. And it kind of points to one of the problems with this storyline. This isn't Terry McGinnis. There aren't any references to Terry's past, the people who he loved or respected. Hell, there isn't even any angst about losing his entire world. And by virtue of the fact that he's gone through a hell of a lot of life-changing experiences by the time Future's End starts, he's a changed person anyway, so it's not the same Terry McGinnis people would be familiar with. You could have anybody in the bat suit and it'd work the same. This isn't Batman Beyond. It's just some dude who happens to wear his costume. This is best exemplified with a line from issue two. I'm a soldier. Point me and my gun in the right direction, Alfred. I'm not a detective. Oh, yeah, sounds exactly like Terry. You recall how militaristic he was and how he was happy to point guns at his villains. Old Bruce was totally on board with that. This is a problem with some big crossovers like this that feature such huge casts of characters. You can sum up that problem with a line from Spock. This pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. Comics, being a visual medium, cares a lot about the visuals of the story. Iconic symbols, costumes, recognizable visual elements that strike a chord in people. But just like how in this story they slap the Superman symbol on Captain Marvel and think that that's enough to cover up for the absence of the Man of Steel, you can't just have someone wearing the Batman Beyond suit and say, Oh yeah, this is Terry McGinnis. Don't you like seeing Terry McGinnis in this setting and talking with the heroes of the past? The strength of a crossover is seeing unique characters characters interacting, bantering, comparing and contrasting. But it's all just on the surface, since all we've got is the look with none of the personality! It's flat. It's boring. It's two-dimensional thinking. Anyway, since Tim is out speaking to Lois, Terry decides to just break into his apartment and see if he can find anything useful there. Unfortunately, Bruce is already there in his armored-up Batman suit and grabs Terry, shoving him around. All right, Junior! First, you're gonna tell me what Tim Drake has to do with this. Then, you're gonna tell me what this is. Your nose should be sharp and pointy, not form-fitting, and you call yourself Batman. Instead of just resolving this situation in five minutes by telling the truth, Plastique rescues him by, well, chucking a marble-sized explosive into the apartment and blowing it up. 
Anyway, the two manage to get away, and we get some character development for them and a budding romance, while Mr. Terrific announces his plans to release the U-Sphere to New York a day ahead of the global release. Alfred can't find any evidence that Brother Eye is still alive after the Cadmus Island stuff, but Terry thinks that his continued presence means that Brother Eye must still be alive, or he'd fade out of existence. Except, of course, you already stepped out of linear time and have altered events by your mere presence, otherwise the early knowledge of your existence by my brother I would have worked to take you out before you were born and I hate temporal mechanics. Anywho, Brother I did indeed survive and starts spreading across the world again via Lois Lane's cell phone until it locates the corpse of future Plastique, transferring itself into it. Alfred detects it, but then realizes something is tracing him and shuts himself off. The Batman Joker cyborg whatever teleports back in time right in front of Plastique. Because the latter half of this series relies upon a lot of coincidence, frankly. Terry goes to help Plastique, along with the arrival of the regular Batman, too. So Batman, Batman, and Batman are all fighting. I feel like this plot point was inspired by someone hitting a bunch of action figures together. As Terry and Plastique get away, we get some more character development on their romance. It's honestly one of the things that actually works in this comic, but, of course, there's parts of it that are completely at odds with the actual Terry McGinnis character from Batman Beyond, as shown by when Plastique kisses him. What? I... I've never done this before. Wow. Big middle finger to Dana Tan, Terry. As the two continue to make out, we see that Bruce is observing them from another rooftop. Considering what the JLU episode epilogue revealed about Terry McGinnis, him peeping on the two making out isn't even the weirdest part of this scene. I have existed since the morning of the world, and I shall exist until the last star falls from the night. Although I have taken the form of Tardius Shadowla, I am all men, as I am no man, and therefore I am- Todd! What? Why are you doing the Caligula thing? Because the cinema snob told me that it was part of Future's End. Is Caligula not in Future's End? No! For God's sakes, why did you do any of this? Because it's your 500th episode, man. Just wanted to celebrate it with you. Oh. Thanks, man. And I walked out of this with a sweet toga. So, uh, all in all, I think I walked out of this on top. It's here where the subplots finally really come together. Tim Drake returns home after all the events in the Firestorm plot, only to find his bar and apartment above it blown up thanks to the stuff that happened with the Batman. But before Terry can explain anything, Joker Bat shows up again. After the group manages to temporarily disable it, Terry finally decides to just explain everything, planning to lead the Joker Bat away while Plastique tells Bruce and Tim what's up on the way to Terrificek. Unfortunately, en route to it is when Brainiac's attack begins. When they reach the building, they find the lobby full of dead bodies thanks to the reborn Brother Eye. Although I think the bigger concern here is that some sort of crossover with Marvel is occurring. These all look like S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. While the Justice League splits up to deal with the attack, Brainiac's probes form a net around Manhattan and summon up the giant Brainiac god creature. Pants have not only darkened, they have become black holes. Hawkman tries to fly into Brainiac's ship to try to get to the Engineer, but when he gets close, he's hit with the images of people screaming. Namely, heroes from across the multiverse. That part is really just a hint for the event that this book was leading into, Convergence. Since it's not relevant beyond that, let's move on. Mr. Terrific, in light of this occurring, is basically in a state of shock until Bruce reaches him. It's glorious, isn't it? Sideline seats on the dawn of a new era. Terrific! What the hell have you done? I've conversed with God. Can you say the same? Is this the human condition of madness, leader? It is. You know what the worst part is? You would think that the whole U-Sphere thing that they've been hinting at throughout this entire comic was building to this. That the spheres that Brainiac is using to steal Manhattan were actually the U-Spheres. But they're not. Brainiac had no reason to be talking to Mr. Terrific throughout this whole thing. As Superman gets inside of Manhattan to help, Dr. Polaris joins up with Firestorm and Captain Marvel to try to help defend people from Brainiac. It's basically chaos. Terry fighting the Joker Bat, Ray Palmer diving into Brainiac's memory core to try to find a way to fight it off, and Bruce finally socking Mr. Terrific to try to snap him out of his delusions. Anyway, the Atom manages to free the Engineer from Brainiac's control. 
Bruce doesn't believe the story about Terry being from the future, since Brother Eye was meant to protect mankind from threats, even though he just faced off against a cybernetic Batman-Joker hybrid thing. And as such, he and Mr. Terrific activate Brother Eye to stop Brainiac. To make matters worse, Brainiac starts lifting Manhattan out of the ground while Terry arrives to help save Tim and Plastique from the Brother Eye-controlled corpse. Or is it controlled? I mean, it starts talking like the future cyborg version instead of the brother eye that's in the past and- ah, This comic makes no sense! Hey, you want to know what the payoff is for the U-Sphere thing? It's a joke about a guy who's been camped out for two weeks in line for one that the Joker bot quips, And you call me crazy! <laughs> oh god, how long have I been reviewing this thing? Anyway, there is actual payoff to the U-Spheres. The plan they quickly come up with to stop Brainiac. With Brother Eye activated, it coordinates millions of U-Spheres to attack Brainiac and use Ray Palmer's size reduction technology to shrink him down enough to contain him inside one of the spheres. Unfortunately, that also means Manhattan starts plummeting to Earth, but luckily Superman comes in and does what Superman does, save the day. In the wake of the reconstruction efforts on Earth, they take one of the giant devices Brainiac had, and Superman tosses it into the sun. And that closes the book on Brainiac. Brainiac comes back like a month later in Convergence. That didn't matter. And because you didn't care about it, Faraday retreats with a geneticist into a secret bunker because he fears what Brother Eye will do. And that bunker's name is Command D! Yeah, I really was not kidding about this being a spiritual follow-up to Countdown. I think that DC really, really overestimates how much their fans really give a crap about the friggin' Kamandi post-apocalyptic Earth stuff. Oh, and he kills Voodoo while Sergeant Rock and the other members of the murder party watch. Yay, you were all pointless. Anyway, to get back to the actual plot, Mr. Terrific tells Brother Eye to disengage from the grid, and he goes full HAL 9000, actually telling him, I'm afraid I can't do that. So does that mean in a future sequel he's gonna end up merged with Mr. Terrific inside of a monolith? Brother Eye reanimates the dead Terrificek personnel as cyber zombies to attack our heroes. Terry goes and meets up with Bruce, the Atom, and Mr. Terrific, and gives them more details about his future and how he got there. Bruce confirming that he wouldn't have believed the story and totally tried to prevent them from stopping Brother Eye because he thought it was infallible. How is it that this room contains three of the smartest men of the DC Universe and two of them are utter dumbasses? And so they decide that with no other options left, they'll fix Terry's time band and complete the original mission. Go back another seven years and prevent Brother Eye from ever being created. While they work on that, Terry goes to rescue Plastique and Tim, but then the Joker Bat shows up and mortally wounds him. Terry manages to kill the Joker Bat somehow, though he gets to say goodbye to Plastique before he hands over the Batman Beyond suit to Tim. Bruce wants to transport back in time himself because he's an arrogant dick. You just can't let anyone else save the world, can you? Tell me who that anyone else is who can, and I'll happily step aside. So you haven't noticed that my supporting cast in this theater of hell is a veritable who's who of incompetent puppets. Alfred says that it's a moot point anyway, since the time jump was calibrated to Terry's weight, and therefore Tim is the closest approximation. They call in Firestorm to be the power they need for the jump, allowing Tim and Madison to finally be reunited and get to have a brief chat before the zombies attack again. Unfortunately, they don't have enough time to charge it up to full power before they start getting overrun, so Terry just jumps, while Batman realizes that the remark about the weight calibration was a lie, since obviously the future Bruce had planned to go himself. At least that's what I inferred from the dialogue, since he just says, WAIT, as if he just had a revelation about it. And frankly, I think this comic is just as eager for it to end as I am. Instead of heading back seven years, Tim travels back five years, specifically to the point when Earth 2's refugees were going to arrive. He starts planting charges on the satellite, but Brother Eye intervenes and disables them. Since this is Brother Eye from before its programming was corrupted, it recognizes the logic that Tim presents about the dark future that's coming and doesn't help the Earth 2 refugees come to Earth as well as self-destructs itself to prevent its presence from becoming known. It also rescues Tim by repowering the armband and sends him into the future. A bright one where Madison is tending a garden full of statues honoring superheroes. Aw, isn't that sweet? A happy ending to an otherwise dark, violent, and yeah, this is complete bullcrap. He failed. I'm not kidding. 
Brother Eye deactivates the hologram, apparently having expected Tim to arrive at this point. It's indeed the future that Terry traveled back from, and the world has still been devastated by Brother Eye and his cyber zombies. So after 48 comics, and however long this episode has been running, it was all for nothing! Da! <laughs> hey Grover, do you want to review comic books? <laughs> Why isn't there more? Why isn't there more? Sacrifice my voice for this episode! No, Star Lord. I am your father. You know what? You know what? I'm just giving in. Team Pilo all the way! Why aren't you real? <laughs> Why aren't you real? It's just a piggy bank! Lavender. Hey, so, uh, it's getting harder and harder for the transmission to keep a lock on you, so here's a random montage of other people whose futures are messed up. In my dark future, I went broke and I can't afford a Disneyland pass, so I've been standing outside the park reviewing the air molecules. That one sucks. I got no idea what everybody's talking about. Things are great. Nothing's really changed. I mean, yeah, tech has advanced pretty impressively over the last few years, but otherwise, everything is fine. 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 Oh, hi, Linkara. I'm sure with Brother I Destroyed Society, everyone's been real worried about me. But don't you worry, I'm fine. My name finally makes sense. For about two weeks, I was finally the number one comic book reviewer on that site we used to belong to, and I've got this great Apple Watch. But more than that, I've built this vault and filled it with the greatest comic books in the world. I'll finally have time to read them all. <laughs> it's not fair. It's not fair. Why did I only fill this with Frank Miller comic book? God, what was I thinking? Oh, I like this one. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Nah, I'm not interested in that anymore. I'm following Diesel from now on. Hey, uh, when do you think they're coming out with issue number two? Hello. It's time for Goth Vega to return! Eh, it's gonna happen. I do still like the music. So, the world has been destroyed by internet trolls. Trolls have taken over the world. And now their headquarters is at the ruins of YouTube, and I had to escape on the spaceship so I could spread peace throughout the galaxy, and we're going to try to retake back the planet. Linkara, if you get this, you are our only hope. Do you know why? Because you are a man! Okay, I think I've recovered, except for my voice. Anyway... Mr. Terrific is there to console him, but not for long, as the cyber zombies soon move in to try to assimilate Tim. Alfred helps as best as he can, but he's clearly outmatched and outgunned. At least until a bunch of human resistance fighters arrive to help. Among them, Ray Palmer and Amethyst. They all escape, but the more important person in the resistance is actually Madison. She might be 30 years older, but Tim's not really going to complain. The Atom explains to Mr. Terrific that while Tim did manage to change events, Terrific Tech was still a constant protected by Brother Eye. So this future was largely unchanged. And so our comic finally, finally ends with Madison saying Brother Eye has won, but Tim saying he hasn't, offering hope that they'll win through. Well, so in case I didn't make it clear during all of this review, this Comic sucks! This was bad. An entire 49 issues of bad. And to be fair, this is certainly not the worst thing I've ever looked at. It's trying, so I can't call it lazy, and most of it is competently done. But man oh man, does it not hold up as a story on its own, or as some potential future for the DC Universe. Lots of plot points just vanish or have no impact on anything. There's no substance to it, no emotional core to make you want to see things go right for everyone, and what's even worse is that it doesn't go right for everyone. In fact, one could argue it goes right for no one! And you want to know why? 
because nothing in this story mattered! Not only do they fail the one job set up by the Zero If issue, prevent Brother Eye from taking over Earth, but because they prevented the Earth 2 refugees from coming to this Earth, everything that we saw did not come to pass and was undone. No, seriously, all those subplots? None of that happened! No war with Apocalypse. No Superman leaving for reasons probably outlined in a tie-in issue. No Captain Marvel as Superman. No Ronnie Raymond and Jason Rush tension. No Maddie getting merged with Firestorm. No Cadmus Island story involving 50 Sue. No Amethyst coming to terms with the loss of Gemworld and falling in love with Frankenstein. No closure for Frankenstein. No dismantling of Shade. No Tim Drake becoming traumatized. No Dr. Polaris. No reasonable questions about the technology superheroes wield, no Command D crap of Faraday, and certainly nothing else that happened in any of this stuff. It was all wiped away. Admittedly, most of those things were terrible anyway, so no big loss there. And yet still, the space-time continuum is circling the drain since some of those things had to happen so Tim could be in this future. But that's met with a shrug because the stupid story is over. As I mentioned in the first part, one of the strengths of 52 in Countdown was focusing on minor characters because you could do more with them that you can't do with the bigger name characters. Trouble is, this takes place five years in the future in a setting that is not going to exist when the series is done with. So instead of utilizing the inherent strengths of these minor characters to expand on them, it's an excuse to just do whatever the hell they want with them, even if it doesn't fit with who these people are supposed to be. And why not? It doesn't matter. Nothing in this story matters. And since they don't matter, most of the characters are completely one note. Grumpy jerks who have no emotional depth or fail to have any sense of humor or warmth. But even when they sometimes do, it's either not handled well or it's just so tonally all over the place like with 50 Sue, I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to get out of it. It really does exemplify the new 52, doesn't it? Dark, violent, full of very little hope, and poor characterization. The color red dominates its dreary atmosphere, and it's just a massive slog to get through. What little good there is in it is stretched out so much you can barely tell that there's anything there at all. And in the end, most of it is discarded or forgotten when much better stories come along. And indeed, better stories did come along. The event that this was leading into, Convergence, was a lot better than it had any right to be. It wasn't great, but it was enjoyable in its own way while simultaneously ignoring everything that happened in Future's End except for the retcons about Brainiac. And even that's questionable since it doesn't really go the whole unknowable cosmic horror route that John Constantine was pushing. Just really big and powerful and stuff. For all the talk of Brainiac and the horrors it would bring, it just ended up trying to steal a city just like Brainiac always does and shoving it in a bottle. Way to think outside the box there, Future's End. Tim's story as Batman Beyond would continue into a solo Batman Beyond book that eventually would start bringing the world mostly back to normal while also eventually restoring Terry McGinnis too. So yes, even that plot point of Tim becoming the new Batman Beyond would eventually not matter because nothing in this story mattered. We hope you've enjoyed No Moral Theater, ladies and gentlemen. So that's it for Future's End and the 500th episode. Like this entire show, it's been a hell of a ride. Okay, if you're done with your review, we need to do something about the future. Yeah, none of them were helpful in finding Brother Eye. I don't really know what you expect me to do about it. But our records show that Brother Eye is connected to a reviewer you know. Uh, someone that you trust and have frequent communications with. You've got to know where it is. Lupa, where did you get that eye patch? What eye patch? I see you have finally found me. Indeed. So, what is it you want, Brother Eye? I? I want to play a game. Are... are you sawing me? Is this a saw thing? Oh, but it is. And it's all too appropriate. It was saw that started this. And it will be saw that finishes it. What does Saw have to do with me? I've never reviewed anything related to Saw before! And that's the point. That's why I wanted you to see how the future 
Everyone you know and love are in such turmoil because you never finished what you started. Just like I didn't. I don't know what you're talking about. I... Wait. Saw? Unfinished review? Unfinished retrospective? Well, she? So now you know the truth. I am the one behind Brother Eye. I did all of this, Linkara. All to get back at you. What did I do? In 2013, at MAGFest, we filmed a crossover for the movie Dead Silence. We filmed a bunch of live-action sequences. You were supposed to write the voiceovers. I even did research. Me. Research. And you didn't use any of it. I got busy, man. It became less of a priority and I just never got around to it. That crossover was going to make me, Linkara. It's taken me years of contemplation and consideration to realize that one review would have made me the greatest reviewer on Channel Awesome, thus giving me the power to reprimand everyone. This seems a little petty, especially since neither of us are on there anymore. Without that crossover, I lost all motivation to complete any more videos. No more Killjoy. No more of my planned retrospectives that I intended to do. No more Bond Month. And I never finished my Soul Retrospective. And it's all because of you. So, wait, if you were Brother Eye all the time, and Brother Eye was in Lupa, does that mean that Phalus isn't actually attached to her? No, that part's still true. Stop making me watch Charmed with you! This is game over, Linkara. The future is full of hardship and change for your friends and loved ones. Even your future has nothing to look forward to. Yeah, well, here's the problem. The future is all about change. Yes. But it'll change for the worst. Maybe. But in the end, that's the risk you take just by living. You make choices throughout your life and hope that, in the end, it will all turn out right for you. 500 episodes ago, I chose to record myself doing a review of a Spider-Man comic. And look where that choice brought me. It brought you to your doom. Yeah, but you also saw fit to show me that future, Welshy. And knowing how the future turns out, I can change it. And yet, nothing has changed. I'm still here, and you will end up in that dark and dangerous future five years from now, and... What are you doing? Fixing the future. Hello? Hey, Walshy. Hey, Linkara! I don't know how you got this number, but what's up? Hey, I was thinking lately about that Dead Silence crossover we filmed a few years ago, and I just wanted to say that I'm sorry I never got around to finishing that. Hey, it's no problem, man. I'm not even doing the review thing anymore anyway. Yeah, but still, I'm sorry I never got it done. If I do ever get around to finishing it, do you still want to do it? Oh, totally, totally. Look, if you ever get the script done, just shoot it my way. Thanks, man. Huh. Well, that's the way it goes. Well, that was incredibly easy to fix. Almost as if this entire future didn't matter. I tell a lie, of course, because it did matter. It matters to me that all of you are still around and watching this show after so long. So from all of us here at Atop the Fourth Wall, a sincere thank you for watching these 500 episodes. And even if the future does end, let's make it a good ending. Uh, I'm still on the phone. Oh, right. Wait, is the only reason you called me to undo some dark, twisted future? Are you not actually sorry about the crossover? That's it, Linkara. I will have my revenge on you for this. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow, 
but soon, in the next five years, I will have my vengeance, and then I will have the power to reprimand everyone. 500 episodes, roll credits! friends. Before we get to my re-review of Old Fashioned, I would like to offer you a cat. <laughs> get, get her out of here. She's sniffing around my foot. But it's not. It's because I hate you all. You're a bunch of stars and stripes bleeding wankers. And yes, I have cut open a lot of Americans and you do indeed bleed stars and stripes. I'm not sure how it works. This is science stuff. Anyway, I really do not approve of eating. Tough titty! Yes, ma'am. As you can see, back in the early 2000s, lamps just weren't made to last. After all, this lamp is only 35 years old. What the heck? Look at this. Flimsy, broken plastic. Look at it, just broke. It's just crumbling in my hands. You know? I mean, what's a quality lamp reviewer to do? Except pan this crap. I mean, gee whiz. What a piece of crap! Fortunately, in the future, lamps are much higher quality. They wouldn't disintegrate like this one. So, now you know the truth. I am the one behind for the rest.